Elmer by David McKing. There was once a herd of elephants, elephants young, elephants old, elephants tall or fat or thin, elephants like this, that or the other, all different but all happy and all the same colour. All that is except for Elmer. Elmer was different. Elmer was patchwork. Elmer was yellow and orange and red and pink and purple and blue and green and black and white. Elmer was not elephant coloured. It was Elmer who kept the elephants happy. Sometimes he joked with the other elephants, sometimes they joked with him, but if there was even a little smile, it was usually Elmer who started it. One night, Elmer couldn't sleep for thinking, and the think that he was thinking was that he was tired of being different. Who ever heard of a patchwork elephant, he thought. No wonder they laugh at me. In the morning, before the others were really awake, Elmer slipped quietly away, unnoticed. As he walked through the jungle, Elmer met other animals. They always said, good morning, Elmer. Each time, Elmer smiled and said, good morning. After a long walk, Elmer found what he was looking for. A large bush, a large bush covered with berries, a large bush covered with elephant coloured berries. Elmer caught hold of the bush and shook it and shook it and shook it so that the berries fell on the ground. Once the ground was covered in berries, Elmer lay down and rolled over and over, this way and that way, and back again. Then he picked up bunches of berries and rubbed himself all over, covering himself with berry juice, until there wasn't a sign of yellow or orange or red or pink or purple or blue or green or black or white. When he had finished, Elmer looked like any other elephant. After that, Elmer set back off to the herd. On the way, he passed the other animals again. This time, each one said to him, Good morning, elephant. And each time, Elmer smiled and said, Good morning, pleased that he wasn't recognised. When Elmer rejoined the other elephants, they were all standing quietly. None of them noticed Elmer as he worked his way into the middle of the herd. After a while, Elmer felt that something was wrong. But what? He looked around. Same old jungle, same old bright sky, same old rain cloud that came over from time to time, and lastly, same old elephants. Elmer looked at them. The elephants were standing absolutely still. Elmer had never seen them so serious before. The more he looked at the serious, silent, still standing elephants, the more he wanted to laugh. Finally, he could bear it no longer. He lifted his trunk and at the top of his voice shouted, Boo! The elephants jumped and fell, always in surprise. Oh my gosh and golly, they said, and then saw Elmer, helpless with laughter. Elmer, they said, it must be Elmer. Then the other elephants laughed too, as they had never laughed before. As they laughed, the rain cloud burst, and when the rain fell on Elmer, his patchwork started to show again. The elephants still laughed as Elmer was washed back to normal. Oh, Elmer! gasped an old elephant. You've played some good jokes, but this has been the biggest laugh of all. It didn't take you long to show your true colours. We must celebrate this day every year, said another. This will be Elmer's day. All elephants must decorate themselves and Elmer will decorate himself elephant colour. And that is exactly what the elephants do. On one day a year, they decorate themselves and parade. On that day, if you happen to see an elephant of ordinary elephant colour, you'll know it must be Elmer. Hi, so today we are going to do a little bit of predicting using the story Elmer. So if you haven't seen it yet, then maybe hold out and, and go and watch it after we've done this one. Um, if you have, you can still have a really good go. What we're going to do is choose four pictures from various different points of the story and see if we can predict what we think might happen next. When we say predict, what we mean is have a really well-educated guess at what we think might happen. So we might be able to pull from things that we already know. Now, this is the first Elmer book in the series. There are actually lots of them. So if we were to look at 
a subsequent one, if we were to look at um, another one in the series, then what, we might be able to pull information from this book to help us predict what might happen in another book. But in this case, this is the first one, so it's difficult to use that. But we can also use information from what's happened previously in the story and in other stories as well. So let me show you the first picture. So here it is, here is the first picture. And we can see Elmer on there. And this is where we first learn that Elmer is different. That Elmer is not the same as all of the other uh, animals, all of the other elephants, because Elmer is patchwork. So he's multicolored. So I wonder at this point in the story, whether or not we could predict what we think might happen in the story. There's an awful lot of talk about Elmer being different and then this whole page goes on to explain why Elmer is different. So this makes me believe that Elmer is going to maybe be unhappy with the fact that um, he's different in the story and maybe want to not be, maybe. In terms of plan and what would happen action-wise, I'm not 100% sure what that would look like. But at, th at this moment in time, my gut instinct tells me because there's so much talk of being different, that Elmer is going to want to not be different and maybe do something to look like all of the other elephants. Maybe. What do you think? Yeah, maybe. Okay. Let's have a look at the next picture then. That's the next bit on in the story. So the next bit is this picture here where Elmer is shaking the berry bush. And they've been very specific about the fact that this bush is covered with elephant coloured berries. So this leads me to believe that my first predictor was absolutely spot on and that Elmer is going to try and make himself elephant coloured using these berries. Now, I can use my prediction skills to say that he might stomp on the berries because the elephant is quite heavy and by stomping on the berries that would release the berry juice from them. But I'm not 100% sure how that would make him elephant coloured unless he just wants elephant coloured feet or there's also a bird in the picture so maybe the bird is going to help maybe the bird is going to pop the berries over him or maybe the elephant berries aren't for Elmer at all because earlier in the story it talked about Elmer being the one that would always play jokes on the other elephants so maybe Elmer is going to turn the bird into elephant coloured rather than the orange bird that it is and maybe um, he's going to play a trick on the rest of the elephants that would equally fit with the theme of the rest of the story and everything that we know about Elmer as a character so far. So yeah, I like the odds of that as a prediction there. Can you think of anything else that might happen? Yeah, maybe. Maybe the maybe the tree will yeah, maybe like the tree will will break and the story is a completely different story to the one that I first imagined. Yeah, maybe he might have to use the tree as like part of a rescue or something. That could absolutely happen. He's an elephant, they're strong, so he would be able to lift that. He would be able to carry it to somewhere um, and use it for a rescue, definitely. Okay, good prediction so far. Okay, so I've skipped a load of the book and this page says when Elmer rejoined the other elephants they were all standing quietly none of them noticed Elmer as he worked his way to the middle of the herd so looking at that page I can see that Elmer coloured himself elephant coloured and now he's worked his way into the middle of the crowd so I wonder if we can work out what we think might happen next from this point in the story so we know that Elmer was or we think that Elmer was unhappy with being different. We never actually read that, that part of the story, but we think that. We know that Elmer has coloured himself elephant coloured using those berries that he shook off the tree. And now he's in the middle of the herd with all of the other elephants there. Now, I guess maybe if we think that he doesn't like being different, then maybe... I don't know, maybe he'll get found out. Maybe he'll get found out by the other elephants. Although they're all standing quietly and I know that Elmer is the troublemaker. Elmer is the one that makes all the jokes. So I wonder whether Elmer is going to make some sort of joke or 
surprise the other elephants in some way i feel like that would be that would be a good way to move the story on because at the moment they're all just stood there really quietly and elma just fits in so I feel like something has to happen. Either Elma is found out by one of the elephants or that they notice that Elma is missing, maybe. I guess that could happen because Elma is, looks super different and they would notice that Elma was um, missing. So maybe it could be that they, they could go on a hunt. They could go searching for Elma. I guess there are lots of directions that the story could take at this point because... All those elephants are just standing there. They all look the same. Something has to happen to move the story on. Otherwise, it's going to be an incredibly boring book. And obviously, we know this isn't the end of the story. So, yeah, there are lots of things that could happen, aren't there? They could notice that Elma was missing. They could go looking for Elma. Elma could be discovered. Or Elma could play a joke because we know that Elma likes to play jokes on the others. That's something that we learned earlier in the book so many things that could happen and also all really logical explanations so we can reason exactly why we think they might happen it's not like we're saying oh well i think a tiger is going to come and chase all of the elephants away because there's no reason for that to happen we we've not seen any indication that this book would be about primarily anybody other than those elephants so i think that's going to be where the focus is here we go. Right, all those elephants are laughing. So here is the final page that we are going to um that we're going to use. And they're all laughing. And it's also started to rain. Now those berries were never going to last through the rain, were they? So Elmer is showing his true colours there, which is exactly what they say. Um so I believe what happened just previous is that Elma made them all jump and then they knew that it was Elma and the result of that was that everybody started to laugh and then the rain clouds started to rain and then obviously the rain is therefore washing the grapes off Elma. So Elma now looks like Elma again. They knew it was Elma anyway because he played a joke and Elma's great at jokes. So I wonder what might happen from here then. So there is a little bit more of the story. And if we read the whole page, then it would give it away. Hence why I have um, cropped it down to just the picture. But they're all having a really great time. Now, Elma is back to being Elma coloured. So being elephant coloured obviously wasn't going to last. So I wonder what on earth they're going to do next. Elma could go back to that bush and use the berries to roll in again. Although if Elma shook all of the berries off the tree, then there's not going to be any more left. And also, he did it as a as a joke. It, he played a joke in the end. Would the same joke be funny more than once? I mean, maybe, but maybe not. And also, it's raining and Elma is going back to Elma colours, going back to being patchwork. So that's an awful lot of effort to go to, to then be rained off again the next time that rain cloud comes and, and washes it away again. So I'm going to say that I don't think that would be what happened next. But I do love how happy all of those other elephants are about what Elma has done. So I wonder whether maybe... Just maybe they are going to suggest that they reciprocate, that they try and make themselves look like Elma and they celebrate the day, like the time when Elma played a really good joke on them. Because I think they're really enjoying the fact that he's done that and he's played that joke. I think they think it's really funny. So my prediction is that they will want to do the same but in reverse because they are already elephant coloured and it obviously wouldn't work if they painted themselves with the same bush. I wonder how they'd go about doing that. Do you know what? We made some really great predictions today and in actual fact just in case you haven't 
um seen the story yet like do go and watch it because it is great but that is exactly what they decide at the end they decide that they should have a party once a year and they should paint themselves elmer colored or different colors multicolors and elmer should paint himself as an elephant in elephant colors and they should celebrate the day that he played the jokes predicting is basically having a really good educated guess so it's using the clues that are around to help to have a think about what we think might happen either just in the story in general or what might happen next sometimes when i'm reading for pleasure um i'm trying to work out what i think will happen next and where the twists and turns are going to come because i quite like stories that are like that where you'll think you know what's happening and then there'll be a twist and everything's changed and you you didn't see it coming some really great predicting you can use it when you're reading or if you're going to watch something you're going to watch a film or something you could use it then whatever you do with the rest of your day have a great one bye bye hi so today we are going to have a look at something called the inverse sounds tricky and um, basically what we're looking at is the fact that addition and subtraction are opposite to each other so if we start with some really simple numbers that might help so i'm also going to draw it so if we have three and two we have five all together you're right and then basically what the inverse is is that if i have five and i take three of them away i will have two left so three add two equals five but five take away three equals two so from this one number sentence i can come up with multiple different number sentences because I know the opposite to be true. So if I have, let's do it with numbers, because some some people work with pictures so better, some people work with numbers better. So if I had six and I added three to it, then I would have nine all together. Now, if I took that nine and I took three away from it, exactly there are only three numbers in the number sentence i can't use anything that's outside of the number sentence so it must be six in exactly the same way as if i did nine take away six it would be three because there's only three left so when i come to manipulating number sentences i can create an awful lot of number sentences from just one beginning one but what I can also do is I can use my subtraction knowledge to check my addition knowledge or the other way round. Often it's my subtraction knowledge that isn't quite as strong as my addition knowledge. So I can use what I know about adding to check whether or not my subtraction is right. So if I was doing 21, take away 17, I might choose to do that in my head. I might choose to do it using an empty number line. I think I might do it that way. I think I might do it using an empty number line. So I think I'll put 21 at one end and then I'll count back 17 with one big jump and then seven little jumps. And then 21, 10 less would be 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Right, so I think that 21 take away 17 equals 4. And the way that I can check that is by adding 17 and four together so i can do 17 and four equals and i'm going to try it just to check and make sure that i'm right because that's what i'm using the inverse for so 17 add four 17 18 19 20 21 so it does absolutely they match so if 17 add four is 21 then 21 take away 17 is indeed four so I can use the inverse to check with addition and with subtraction. So let's do an example, that's subtraction. Let's do an example where you do that and then we'll use the inverse for checking addition as well. And then we'll have a look at all the different number sentences that we can make when we know about the inverse and we know one number sentence. So let's do the number sentence 27, take away 13. So to start with, let's see if we can work out what we think it is. Now, you might choose to do an empty number line, in which case it will look something like this. 
you might not you might choose to count back in your head you it's completely up to you what how you go about doing that um i'm going to use this empty number line to work out the answer so i know i need the 10 which is 17 and then 16 14 16 15 14 so i believe that 27 take away 13 equals 14 from using my empty number line but i am going to do 13 and 14 or i could do 14 and 13 because it doesn't matter which way around if i'm adding and hopefully if i'm right the answer will be 27 so i'm going to do 13 add 14 if i add the ones then that's seven i add the tens then that's 20 so it is indeed 27 so i use the inverse to check it's the opposite and if you find one easily and the easier than the other then having the opposite to check using the inverse to check is brilliant because it means that we can be more successful with the other one that we're not so confident with let's have a go at doing an addition and see if we can use the subtraction just to check it so this time let's do 14 add 19 so we do 14 add 19 you can do it however you want if you want to use an empty number line you can it will be well it depends on which way you do it i think i would add the 14 on so it would be one big jump and four little jumps added on to 19 so you could choose to do it that way if you wanted to or you could choose to break the tens and the ones up and add them mentally what did you get to i got to 33 now to check whether or not i think that i'm right using the inverse I'll start at 33 and I'll take one of these away and it should be the other one that I get to. I'm going to take 14 away and hope that I get to 19. So 33 take away 14 and I'm hoping that the answer will be 19. And I'm going to do the taking away using an empty number line with one big jump and four little jumps. From 33, a 10s jump would be 23 and then I'm counting back in ones. 20 so 23 to here 22 21 20 19 there we go so i used my inverse knowledge the fact that addition and subtraction are opposite to be able to check my answers let's do one more where it's an addition and we aim for using the subtraction as the inverse to check you can do all the hard work this time though so this time let's do 21 and 13 21 add 13 that was an easier one to do mentally wasn't it 34 okay so if we're going to check the inverse we're going to do 34 we could either do 34 take away 21 or we could do 34 take away 13 i'm going to go with 34 take away 13 because it requires less counting back so i'm going to do 34 take away 13 and I'm going to use an empty number line to do it. So 34 at the right hand end and then a 10 and three ones. 10 less than 34, 24, 23, 22, 21, which is exactly what I wanted it to be. At this point, I'm quite happy that I'm right, but I could always do the other one if I really needed to double check. Triple check? I've already double checked, haven't I? So now we know that little secret and we can use that to help us. What we can also do is write a huge amount of number sentences from one starting number sentence. So let's start with something really simple, something that has to be correct. So let's start with three add four equals seven. No arguments from me there. So if three and four equals seven, you know three other, three other addition number sentences from that one. You know one that ends in seven and you know two that begin with seven. So you know that four add three equals seven, well done. And you also know that seven is the same as three add four and seven is the same as four add three. Brilliant, well done. But you also know that seven take away three Oh, what must it equal if i'm not sure look here's my top number sentence i've used the seven i've used the three 
four's the only one left. So I know that seven take away three equals four. And I know that seven take away four equals three. Wow. Now, you also know two more things, but they're trickier. Remember, this is the same as this. So you also know that four is the same as seven take away three. And you know that three is the same as seven take away four. So to write that down, we would do this and this. But when we're doing this, it's important that this block here that goes before it stays that way round. Because with subtraction, if we were doing three take away seven, we wouldn't get four, would we? So with this bit, it's always important that that bit just gets transferred to the other side of the equal sign. Let's have a go at doing one together. So again, we'll go with relatively small numbers because in actual fact, it doesn't really matter the size of the numbers. The things are the same, but let's go with relatively small numbers that we know to be true. So let's go with 11 and 9. 11 add 9 equals 20. Exactly, it's a number of 1 to 20, isn't it? 11 add 9 equals 20. So there are three addition facts that you know. Well done. You know 9 add 11 equals 20. And then you know that 20 equals 11 add 9. And 20 equals 9 add 11. Well done. And then from that, you also know some subtraction facts. So you know that 20 take away 9 equals, what's the other number that's left? 11. And you know that 20 take away 11 equals 9. Well done. So, so far, we've got this far. And now we're going to do the other bit of the number centres. So... What I'm going to do to remind myself is draw a block around the bit of the number sentence that has to stay as it is. So this bit stays like this. And in this example, this bit stays like this. So 11 equals 20 take away 9. So 11 equals goes first. And then that little block is going to stay the same. 20 take away 9. And then... 9 equals, because that was the one underneath, and again, 20 take away 11, because that bit stays the same. Now, this bit here that we're doing at the bottom is a lot more complicated. So if you can't get it and you need more practice, don't be super frustrated with yourself. It's really not the end of the world. But it's worth persevering with because in actual fact, I can tell you so many number facts related to that one fact that you gave me at the beginning by just using the three numbers that are in it. But when we're doing this, this just helps us to remember that all this means is, is the same as. So this here is the same as this. But logically, if you're doing a takeaway, you're not taking 20 away from your nine because once you've took nine away from nine, you've got none left, you'd have to go into minus numbers and that's a lot more complicated. We don't need to worry about that right now. Right, super, super speedy. One last one. I'll give you the whole number sentence because I'm feeling nice. But this time I'll give you the takeaway number sentence. So this time let's do 20 takeaway 18 equals two. So that's your, your number sentence. How many different ones can you get from that, can you get the addition ones from it as well? Can you get the subtraction ones going the opposite way where the answer, where the single number is on the left hand side of the equal sign? How many can you get? I've got nearly all of them, I think. I went totally backwards with them and finished with the simple addition. So 20 take away 18 equals 2. So 20 take away 2 
equals 18. And then 2 equals 20, take away 18. 18 equals 20, take away 2. 20 equals 18, add 2. 20 equals 2, add 18. And then 18 and 2 equals 20. And 2 add 18 equals 20. How did you get on? Do you know what? It's tricky. But as long as you can use the inverse so you understand that addition and subtraction are opposite and we can use them to help us check our answers that's the most useful thing but just knowing that we can pull multiple number facts from one number sentence is really helpful sometimes well done persevere with it get somebody to give you a number sentence the whole of it and see how many you can do if you do one a day for a week i reckon you'll nail it whatever you do with the rest of your day enjoy it bye bye so today we are looking at living and non-living things and how we can categorise between the two. So there are a number of things that living things need or that they can do. So living things can move, grow, need water and food, can breathe and can reproduce. Non-living things can't do any of these things by themselves. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we go through each one, because there are some obvious exceptions, but they're not really. So let's start with moving. Living things can all move by themselves. Humans use their legs to move. They can run, they can walk, they can skip, they can swim, they can use their arms and their legs to move there. Um, and lots of mammals and other animals are the same. Some animals toboggan. They slide on their bellies like penguins or they slide on their bellies like snakes. That's not called tobogganing, but it is for a penguin. Or like monkeys, maybe they might use their arms and their legs to swing in the trees. They might have wings that they might fly with. There's not a um, picture of that there, but the birds use their wings to fly, don't they? And fish use their fins to swim. Plants move too. A sunflower will move its head throughout the day to track the sun so it follows the sun all day so that it's always getting the best bit of sunshine on the on the flower. There you go. But movement is one that could be a bit contentious because you could say to me well a car can move and i would say but a car is not alive both of us are correct a car can move and a car is also not alive because a car can't move by itself it needs an engine in order to do that the same as a robotic toy can't move by itself so although some non-living things do move they don't move of their own accord they don't move naturally so that's how we can tell the difference between the between the two okay let's have a look then at growing so living things can grow all living things grow from saplings we get trees from seeds we get plants and flowers Animals grow from the baby, the young, into adults, as do humans. Humans start their lives as babies and then grow into toddlers and children and adolescents and teenagers and adults. And then they become elderly. They become older people. They grow throughout the years. Growing doesn't necessarily always mean getting bigger or getting taller. It can just mean getting older. Certainly with humans, we reach a certain stage where we don't grow any taller. Um, but we do continue to grow older. Non-living things can't grow. My car will always be the size that my car is. Unless I go and get a different car and then I could have a bigger or a smaller car. But the car that I have at the moment will always be the same size. Yeah, so they, they all need to grow. If it can grow by itself, then it is probably a living thing. They need food and they need water, but they don't all get their food and water in the same way. Let's have a little look. So the worm gets its air through its skin. 
it also absorbs nutrients from the soil that way too. A fish absorbs water through its skin. That's how a fish will get the water that it needs. A plant gets its food. If it's a green plant, it gets its food from the sun using a process called photosynthesis. And that is where the plant turns sunlight into food. It will also get nutrients from the ground using its roots and that's how it gets water as well. Some animals will graze, some will gather, some will hunt. So animals get their food in a range of different ways, but they all need food and they all need water. You could argue that a car needs food because a car won't work without petrol, but petrol is not the same as food. It doesn't have a nutritional value. And that's what we mean when we're talking about needing food and we're trying to categorise into living and not living. All living things can breathe, but they don't all breathe in the same way. The trees don't breathe oxygen. The trees breathe out oxygen. They breathe in carbon dioxide. And they don't have a big old pair of lungs because that would be weird. But the trees absorb carbon dioxide. That's what they want, that's what they need. And they expel, they get rid of oxygen, which is great for us because we want it the other way round. We want to breathe in oxygen and we want to expel carbon dioxide. So we're actually very well paired for this world. We and lots of other animals have lungs and our lungs are what we use for breathing. So we breathe in, we breathe in air and what we want from that air is the oxygen. So we absorb the oxygen and we expel, we breathe out carbon dioxide. So that's the opposite to the tree. And that's the way that we do it. Our lungs sit under our rib cage in our chest and we breathe in. We have our mouth and our nose that help us with breathing. And then the air goes into our lungs and then the oxygen from the air is transported around our body via our blood cells. So we actually get energy from the oxygen that we breathe. Hence why if we are doing exercise, if you go outside and you go for a run around or you go and play football or you go swimming, then you will find that you get out of breath, that your body will want to breathe in more energy. It will want to breathe in more oxygen because the oxygen is what powers our bodies to keep going. How very clever. So our lungs work in conjunction with various other systems within our bodies, but our lungs are the thing that we use to help us breathe. I already said previously that the worm is super clever and the worm absorbs all of their air through their entire body. So they don't breathe in to lungs in the same way as we do. And they don't use a nose or a mouth for breathing. They just absorb it through their skin. That's pretty smart for a little earthworm. And fish obviously don't do their breathing in their air through their mouth or through a nose because they live underwater. So the fish have gills. They have gills to help them breathe. Now, non-living things don't need to breathe. They might expel gases. So if you stand behind a lorry or a car or, or if you're you're near traffic at the roadside, then you'll be able to see that those vehicles expel gases through their exhausts, but it's not the same as breathing. They do, that is just the byproduct of their engine working. So their engine is working and that's making, um, basically it's like a waste product and that's what they um, need to get rid of. So if they're not living, then they don't need to breathe. And then it says they can reproduce. So what that means is that they have the ability um, to, as a species, to create young. So you can see the animals there. The animals create young that look like them. They have offspring. Um, and that is the same for humans with the babies as well. 
Um, but trees and plants can reproduce as well. Some of them do it by spreading their seeds. So the picture of the flower at the top is a dandelion and you can blow the dandelion leaves when they when they go from yellow into seeds you can blow them uh, or in actual fact the wind blows them and then the wind carries them and they get dispersed spread out and obviously wherever those seeds go new plants grow grasses grow in the same sort of way and lots of other plants do too birds also transfer seeds and things like that because they eat the berries and things like that off the trees and then they can't digest all of it so they it out while they're flying along and that's how um, other plants get dispersed too. The picture of the tree is an acorn tree so they grow acorns and then those acorns become dispersed and grow new acorn trees. So plants are very clever and they can reproduce just like humans and animals can. Here is a really busy picture, there's an awful lot of things here but I would like you to have a look and I would like you to see if you can sort them into living and non-living things there might be some that are tricky that you're not 100% sure on or you just don't agree that they belong here, but they can be sorted. So have a good look at all of the pictures. Which ones do we think will go in the living? Think about what the living things need to be able to do and which ones will go in the non-living. So they need to be able to move, grow, breathe, eat food and water and reproduce. So which ones do you think will go in each one? Let's just have a look at what we've got. So we've got a monkey, a book, a penguin, a door, an elephant, a fire engine, a tree, a shell, a dinosaur, a leaf, a brown leaf, a car, a flower, a snake, a worm, fish, a house, and some children. So which ones do you think are living and which ones do you think are non-living? And if you've done that and you're super wizzy then maybe you could have a think about if you could add anything else into each of the sides of the diagram. So in the story that I read just this week, the story was Elmer. So Elmer is the elephant. There's an elephant there already, but there were lots of other animals that Elmer met along the way. And there were other things that they used or that happened in the story. So maybe you could see whether or not you think they were living or non-living. Let's have a look at the answers and we'll have a chat about them. So I have living things, monkey, children, fish, penguin, worm, snake, flower, elephant and tree. I have the non-living things as a book, a fire engine, a door, a shed or a house and a car. And then I have three things that are smack bang in the middle for me. I have that brown leaf that's fallen off the tree. I have that empty shell that has been found on the beach and I have the dinosaur in the middle. Do you know why? Can you make a logical guess as to why? Absolutely, because once upon a time, all of those things would have been alive. The leaf would have been attached to the tree, it would have been green, but it died and fell off the tree because the tree is obviously deciduous. The shell would have been a home to a sea creature, but it no longer is, it's empty. It's not alive by itself. It would have been part of a living creature when the sea creature was living in it, but now it's not. And the dinosaur would have been alive once upon a time, but is now extinct. They don't exist anymore. So there are sometimes things that fall somewhere in the middle that once were living but now are not. I think we did some really interesting learning today. You'll be able to see things around and about and determine whether you think they are living or non-living based on those things that we know that they need to be able to do or to have. Whatever you do with the rest of your day, have a great one. Bye-bye.
Hello angel students. Today I want us to have a look at our thoughts. First thing in the morning when we wake up and last thing at night before we go to bed. We're going to have a look at why it's important to start our day with positive thoughts as well as how we end our day in the same way and how it can affect us, improve our days and even our sleep. By now, I don't think I need to tell you, so I'm just gonna ask you because I'm hoping that your answer is going to be yes. But do you know just how important it is that our thoughts, especially the positive ones, have an effect on our emotional health? And did you know the thoughts that we have during those times, being morning and at night, really can help to regulate our nervous system? So by cultivating healthier and happier thoughts, we can have a much more fulfilling life. So one of the first things would be to set the tone. So first thing in the morning when you've woken up, you already know what you've probably got to do for that day. So it, it's important that you set the tone. And by setting the tone, I mean, you know you've got to get up, you know if you have to go somewhere, you know that you've got to brush your teeth, you know you're going to have breakfast. But I don't want you to worry about all of those things. Those are things that are definitely going to happen and you know that those are things that you've got to do. So if there are any things on your list of things to do for the day, those are all things that need to be put to one side when you wake up in the morning because you are going to set the tone for you. So you wake up, you know you're awake. What's usually the first thing that you would do, but more importantly, what's the first thing you would think of? Would you think of reaching for a device? Would you think of just immediately jumping out of bed and getting your day started? What I want you to consider is beginning your day with powerful thoughts. And a good way to do this is as soon as you realize that you're awake, the day has started, you say thank you because you're awake and your day has started. So you say thank you, you're in a state of gratitude, and then you want to set the tone in yourself. All you need to do is be present. Consider how you're feeling, consider where you are, consider remaining in this present moment when you open your eyes, because I say to leave the rest of the things because those are in the future, those are to come, those are not important right now because you know you're going to get to those things and they're going to get done. You're going to go into the bathroom, brush your teeth. You're going to get into the shower. You're going to do all of those things. That's okay. They're fine. They're taken care of in a sense. What you need to do is set yourself up for a very powerful day. And that begins with powerful thoughts. So you may do that by taking some deep breath, becoming very present about where you are and having a moment to pan out your day. What do you see your day being like? What outcomes would you like to have? How would you like to be during the day? Would you like to be calm and peaceful and happy and be able to go with the flow and patient? How do you see your day going? You can visualize that in your mind and you can end that with a couple of affirmations because you decide the kind of day you are going to have because you have given yourself a moment in the morning when you've opened your eyes to have powerful thoughts. Not thoughts of, oh, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. Take a moment, process your thoughts in the moment that you are in, not in an hour's time, not in five minutes time when you've got to get start getting ready for the day. But how does your day look, your ideal day? If your day could go exactly how you wanted it to go and you took a moment every morning to think and see and role play that in your mind as if it were something you were watching like a movie, what would it look like? Then you get up and you start and you have an amazing and powerful day. You set the foundation for a good mood and a productive day. When you take the time out to set your day up how you want it, it can leave you feeling happier about the day to come. It can leave you feeling more confident about the things that you have to do. And also last but not least, a lot more motivated for your day because this gives you the opportunity to remember that you can handle any challenges or setbacks that might come across your path. Why? 
because you have already ensured that your emotional well-being is very balanced by the thoughts that you had with setting the tone for your day to begin with. And earlier I mentioned about regulating the nervous system. So let me first explain what the nervous system is. Our nervous system is like a control center within our body. So when we're in a situation or an environment or whatever is going on around us, it's like the indicator that lets us know how we feel about that. Do we feel happy about it? Do we feel excited about it? Do we feel a bit worried about it? The nervous system will let us know how we feel at any given time in any situation. So when we are in the healthy habit of practicing positive thoughts and a healthy thought pattern, especially first thing in the morning when our body is waking up and we are getting uh, ready for our day, it keeps us in a place of balance and calm. So when the nervous system is balanced and calm and you yourself can practice keeping it that way, you are overall a lot more healthy. And when we're usually thinking and feeling more positive, that will allow our body to release what's known as like feel good chemicals such as endorphins. And that just allows us and helps us to feel a lot more relaxed and content. And within our nervous systems, we have the central nervous system and we have the peripheral nervous system. So with the central nervous system, this is governed by the brain and the spinal cord, the cord which runs down the middle of our backs. And our brains control our thoughts, emotions and actions. And our spinal cord sends messages between the brain and other areas of our body. The peripheral nervous system connects the central nervous system to the rest of our bodies. So this would include the nerves that help us to see, move, taste, feel, touch, and so on. And this is also what helps us to react or respond when we're in different situations. So the, the nervous system is very, very important because it is the indicator for everything. This is why it is very important to keep it as healthy as possible. So in the morning when you wake up, take a moment to be grateful. It could be anything. It could be for the bed that you have. It could be the, for your family. It could be for having food to have breakfast, but just take some time to find a few things that you are genuinely grateful for. It doesn't take a second. Some people will write these things down. You can write anywhere from three to 10 things or as many things that you have time to write that you are grateful for. How you do it is up to you. And affirmations, by now, on this channel, you should definitely have a few affirmations, a few go-to affirmations. So whatever your affirmations are, or maybe now would be a good time to have one that really means something to you, is very close to your heart, or however many, again, that you want. Um, it is also quite useful to have something, whether it's an image, a word, or a sentence like an affirmation, again, that is somewhere that you can see as soon as you wake up. So as soon as you open your eyes, you roll over, you look up, you look to the left, you look to the right, you can see something that reminds you of what makes you feel good, who you are, who you are wanting to become, what goal you are wanting to accomplish. So yes, get your affirmations in check and make sure that you are practicing them. Remember that nothing is going to happen quickly or overnight. It is something that you must consistently practice. And in doing that, it will program you to really understand and believe that anything that you're putting your mind to is something that you can achieve. Because just like with learning anything new, sometimes you have to hear it again and again and again for it to really become a part of you, for you to really remember it or really start to believe in it. So practice that. It's very important. The more that you repeat, repeat, repeat is the more that you will remember and it will become something that eventually is automatic. The main reason that we're wanting to do these things is because we're looking for some type of change, a level of transformation, things that we want to see different. So it is important that we move away from whatever things we are usually telling ourselves because you'd be very surprised at some of the things that are a habit 
of thinking first thing in the morning or thinking throughout the day because it's something you've always done so it's become very automatic to get something different we have to try something different and we can retrain our brain and retrain our thought process to get the results that we are after they say, what is the best way to guarantee the future that you want? What do you think the best way is to guarantee the future that you want, angel students? By creating it. So create. Create. See it. Think about it. Decide what it looks like. Decide how it feels for you. Decide if it feels good, if it feels warm, if it feels exciting. Does it feel like something that is going to fulfill you? Does it make you feel peaceful? Does it bring you joy? Is it something you're excited to share with your friends and family? You decide by creating exactly what it looks like. And I want to give you a little bonus here because sometimes it's difficult to keep track of the types of thoughts you have because they are so automatic. So if you're not really sure what kind of thoughts you have when you wake up in the morning, let's do a little experiment. So for the next few days, let's say for the next three days, every morning when you wake up and every um, night before you go to bed, have a little piece of paper near you where you can just quickly write down what comes to mind as soon as you wake up usually and the same at the end of the day the types of things that you usually start to think about because when you can actually see it in front of you it makes a huge difference to really realizing oh these are the types of things that are on my mind rather than the natural process of you just going away with your thoughts and it being something that you're just used to doing. So if you write them down, you can see them and you can decide, okay, I don't want that one or I'm gonna think about it in this way instead. So that way you again are creating exactly what you want your world to look like both within and without. So now let's go to the end of the day. Just before you are going to sleep, you are going to practice reflecting and appreciating the day that you have just had. So how did it go? What things came up for you? Where were there moments where you might have wanted to improve? And if you could improve on that moment, who would you like to be? How would you have liked to have shown up if you could have and chosen to do anything differently? And appreciate the outcomes, even if there was anything in there that you would have wanted to do differently. Why? Because it has taught you something. When we are in situations, it isn't always about what the situation is specifically, but more about what it's trying to show you, what you can learn from it, how you can better yourself when you get from one point of being in that situation to another. And then being proud of yourself for how you deal with things. So sometimes the next time maybe you find yourself in a situation where you're not really quite sure what's going on or what to do and how to handle it and navigate through it. But you feel like your nervous system isn't quite sure here how to respond or to react. An important and powerful question is what is this trying to show me? What can I learn from this? What lesson can I gain from this so moving forward I can do better? And similar to in the morning when you wake up, think about what went wonderful during your day. What was something that you really, really can just feel grateful for? And if you can find three as a minimum, that's even better. The, the, the key here is to fall asleep in positivity, in happy thoughts, in gratitude, in all the things that went well, rather than worrying about the next day or things that you could have done a completely different way. What you want to do when going to sleep now is think about everything that went well, everything that you are grateful for. It could have been a compliment somebody gave you. It could be something that you weren't even expecting. So that was a lovely surprise. There's always something that you can look back at and think, oh, that was really nice. That was actually really lovely. It can be useful as well to write at the end of your day, like a journal of sorts, but you can also go through that in your mind. For me, 
most importantly when you are getting ready to go to sleep pure relaxation and this is why it's lovely to think about all of the wonderful things that have happened throughout your day because that alone will get you nice and calm and relaxed because you're in a lovely state you're just in a wonderful state and that will set you up to wake up the same so you may practice deep breathing you may put on relaxing uh, music to sleep with in the background all of these things will help to calm the nervous system relax you completely giving you a really good night's sleep we've also spoken about the importance of sleep on this channel and you want to have a very good relaxed sleep so that you are refreshed rejuvenated and ready for the next day remember angel students that you want to start and end your day powerfully and therefore it is crucial that you are aware of the thoughts that you are having when you wake up and before you go to sleep so remember angel students positive thought patterns are crucial for promoting emotional health and nervous system regulation Think of your nervous system as your inner guidance system, something that you want to protect and you want to keep healthy and happy and calm and balanced at all times. So remember, we want to cultivate gratitude, affirmations, reflection and relaxation techniques to keep all of that healthy, regulated, balanced, grounded and protected. In doing so, it allows you to start each day and approach everything that you do with a healthy and balanced mindset and with confidence and optimism that you are in control of creating your future. And one thing I really, really, really want you to remember is just how powerful your thoughts are. Remember, the best way to know your future is to create it. Bye-bye, angel students. Hi, hey everyone. It's video for angel school. What I mean, do a quick exercise for the joints first. One foot point. And raise some ankles. Stretch as far as you can. One, two, three, five, six, change. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Follow your elbow back. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hands straight. Relax your shoulders.
three shoulders. One, two, three chin. One, two, three relax your back. Three, four. Okay, and uh, let's do one round stamina. So knee up, 50, squats, 20, 10 push ups. Knee up, like a knee strike. Stretch your back. When you stand up, stretch front of your body. Two. Three. Question. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And push up ten times. Keep your arms straight, legs straight, body straight. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. Let's do a quick stretch. Side hip into your knees, lean forward from your hips. Try as I ten times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Change. Then forward from your hands. One. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay. Relax, kick, then bend your face on your waist. Use your right hands, touch your right shoes. One. Two, three, seven, eight, and ten. Change. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Eight, nine, ten. Okay, good. So let's practice the routine together. Follow me on the face this way. One, clench your face, elbow strike, and look left. Two, both left bent. Marble and punch. Three, kick. One, 
elbow punch and stop again one elbow two punch three kick elbow roll punch then step one two elbow punch from here up up then stop One, clench your fist, breathing in, and elbow back, breathing out. Then, bubble, hand block, then, bubble, chin scoop, then, kick, elbow, then, block, punch. And step back, blow, kick again, elbow, and punch, and from here, left leg step forward, like up cut, and stop, inhale, and exhale. Time. This time face this way. One. Elbow straight. Two. Three. Four. Elbow. Five. Block. Punch. Step back. Block. Time to your face, breathe in, elbow back, breathe in out, one, marble first, chest combo punch, and then have your kick, elbow, block and punch, then from here, step back, block, Facing your waist, kick, elbow, punch, from here, step, okay. stop, inhale, hands up, and Let's practice the uh, five breathing exercise. Starts with two foot points. So when you practice the breathing, always breathe in, breathing out through your nose. Whole body relax. Turn your hands to your feel stretch. Breathing in. Collecting all the good energy to repair your body. Breathing out. Relax your shoulders, elbow. And much use your hands to touch the floor. And three times. One, feel the breathing. And feel the movement. Okay, movement meditation. Two.
Please like and subscribe so you could get more and more lessons.